Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming to see me talk, rather than the, uh, the talk on hacking into cars. I might have been in that one as well. Uh, so my name is Chris Doman. Um, I built a tool called Threat Crowd. So I'm going to talk about a couple other things kind of linked to it as well. Uh, I work at a company called Vetra Networks, but Threat Crowd is something I built in uh, my spare time over the last couple of years. So just to get an idea of where I should be pitching this, how many of you, like rough show of hands, have used Threat Crowd or know what it is? Okay, like half. I won't go into too much detail on all of it then. So this is threatcrowd.org. This is the, the front page. Um, it's a threat intel platform. And by that I mean it's a database of bad stuff. So sandbox reports, passive DNS, who is data, all that kind of stuff stuck into a uh, web front end so you can search through it quickly. I'll show you how I use it and how you might want to use it. A quick demo at the end too. First explain why I built this. Um, this looks a bit messy, it is, but this is the kind of reality of what I would do in my last job when I was doing a lot of either instant response, I'd be trying to track down detection on a host or network detection SOC style work where I get an alert in. I'd try and find out, is that alert, is it a real detection, is it actually bad? If it is, how bad is that detection on this network? And if it's really bad, then what else should I be looking for? Maybe there are other indicators I need to find. And on a related note to Threat Intel 2, kind of taking a bit of a step further there, building up profiles and attackers, trying to find out you know, who they might be targeting, the infrastructure they've got, the tools, all that kind of stuff. So that's how I, uh, why I built the tool originally. I wanted something to do that. And at the time, there were some tools. I'll show you some of those in a minute. But a lot of it really just came down to open source intelligence, by which people just mean Google at the end of the day. So I Googled that domain. I felt happy to Google it. I go on a malware, which is a great sandbox site, really report, get some who is data out, maybe go through the virus total too, um, another great tool. And the aim of Threat Crowd was to have something that would unify that in one place. Another uh, use case that I wasn't expecting is more on the offensive side. So there's an API in Threat Crowd, that big database of um, domains, that kind of thing. And people are using it in bug bounties, pen testing. So when people are looking for that low-hanging fruit, everyone else is just looking at the main site there. A lot of people are making pretty good cash for the bug bounties by finding an old dev server on some weird subdomain that's just been left up, that kind of thing. So a lot around that too. So I have a quick run through the interface. Um, sounds like at least half of you know it a bit already. So a lot of things start with the search. So you can search for, say, uh, the name of your company or a theme, and you'll find domains related to that. So nothing special there. A couple of things here, though, is it will rank those results based on things like, is there malware pointing at that domain? Is it a dynamic domain? Um, a couple of other really basic scoring things there around what might that make that domain fishy. So I mean, looking up here, there's a, it's a pretty easy target. So it's to bet that's the kind of thing that you might expect a lot to be around. And see down there, there are a couple of dynamic domains that I haven't got anything attached to, but probably a suspect. This is the main interface, the threat crowd. Probably looks quite familiar if you haven't used it before. If you use uh, Palantir or Multigo or any of those kind of pretty graph things, this pretty much works the same way. So on the left-hand side, you've got the graph, and the dark blue spot, that's ours, that's the indicator we're looking at. And then connects to it is uh, some IP addresses that maybe that domain resolved to. There's some malware in the kind of yeah, purpley kind of color, with some hashes. That's the malware talking to that domain. Um, there's some antivirus detections on there. It's all linked up together. And the idea here is going back to that SOC analyst uh, or someone like that looking at detection and trying to quickly find out what might be related. So there needs to be a bit of judgment involved. The uh, computer won't do it all for you. But you can quickly get an idea of what you might be looking at. Anything with a really bright, lime, horrible green circle around the edge, that's uh, something with a report reference to it too. The right-hand side is all that data, more tabular view. So your passive DNS data, your who is data, all that kind of stuff in there that you can browse through. And the key of uh, that whole process in any tool like this is the pivot. So you're going through, you've got the domain, where do you go next? Where do you find that next piece of information? You can right click on the graph and you can jump to it that way. Or on the right hand side, you can uh, jump through, say, the hash to find the AV names or that kind of stuff that you might want to find out. And there's some thought in there. So if something's not going to lead you anywhere, so if it's an IP address and there's only that one domain you really know about, it's not going to be a link. And there's some kind of shortcuts kind of there to try and save you a little bit of time. Yeah, tons of stuff you can pivot on. So if you're researching this kind of stuff, whether in a threat intel or like a SOC type scenario, 
all the things we'll know about. So the domain ports and IP, you can get all that kind of data out. Some weirder stuff there too. So a lot of people are talking recently about SSL certificates. They're a great way of uh, chaining through. So the attackers will often reuse the same SSL certificate on different infrastructure. We track it over time. Uh, I also tried hashing uh, basically NMAP output of servers. So sometimes people reuse the same gold build on a uh, bad server and pivot through that way. That doesn't work very well, it turns out. Um, <laughs> similarly, I also tried hashing uh, sandbox output. So there's a lot of work going on around how much can you cluster on malware based on the dynamic behavior. See, there's another piece of software just like it. You don't know about already. Again, that works a bit, but not that great. Oh yeah, and there's some smarts in there again as well. So on that graph, if it thinks something's in a sinkhole or a parking range, um, so parking ranges, sometimes attackers will just point the domain at local host or something so you just can't see where it's going. It won't automatically pivot on that. It'll make a bit of a guess there. You can browse through. There are a few thousand reports indexed in there with all the indicators. You probably don't want to go through and browse all those domains, but uh, all those reports, but that's an option for you. There's also blacklist too. So this is an idea of extending that functionality to actually be able to apply that automatically. So blacklists, I mean, God, they've been around for, what, 20 years? Um, the last Talos talk was talking about some of the problems of using big blacklist as your way of stopping stuff. Again, not fantastic. But a lot of people do feed into this, so you do get some crowdsource kind of um, intelligence there, people for free saying, this thing's bad. A lot of people say that Google's bad, that kind of thing, so there are problems with that, so can't just trust anything like that. And a couple of other problems I have with that as well that I'll go into in a minute. RSS feed too. So it's really important to monitor any infrastructure of interest. So if there's an IP address that you know has hit you before or always hosts something pretty bad, use an RSS feed. See every time something new pops up. Or if there's a malware family you particularly care about, any time that another sample comes in, it'll hit up there. Obviously, the data source here isn't as big as something like virus total, but it is free. A Multigo, this is how I uh, use this mostly myself. I guess a few of you probably use Multigo already based on what you were saying earlier. Great tool, um, links up to tons of things. Threat Crowd has a free plugin for that. Um, Threat Miner 2 has got one, if you haven't seen that before, but worth checking out. And the API, it's great to see how much stuff's been plugged into Threat Crowd now. So it's all kind of random stuff people are coming up with. So there's some Splunk apps that link into it. Um, some people have got some other log processing stuff. I don't actually understand how that all works, but it seems to hit on some of the, uh, the feeds coming in. Tons of other things, too, where you can whack in domain, and from the command line, you can have the interface, too. So first version, the API, hacky, horrible CSV. You'd actually hit a GET request, get a CSV back. Uh, now a JSON format. It looks a bit like VirusTotal. And the idea there is that if you've really got code for VirusTotal, you don't need to change everything in order to integrate this. And quite a few people have asked me what Threat Crowd's built on. Um, it's not that. It's not as cool as those kind of graphs up there. It's actually really simple. And a few people that ask me, like, what's it built on? They've been asking because they've tried to build similar things. So I mean, there's so many people that have built a Threat Intel platform, because that's the big cool thing, at least it was a couple of years ago. And then they gave up because they got all their cool databases in there, linked everything up, and then, like, you know, six months down the line, nothing was working. I've gone for the opposite approach, and that's just because I was programming my spare time at home. Honestly, I wrote some of the code a bit drunk, but that's okay because you can do that with PHP and MySQL. You don't want to trust all of that, but you know you can do it. Um, and yeah, it's simple. It works. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here have been coding in PHP and SQL since they were 15. You know, you can just pick it up. You might not want to build a, something enterprise on that, but it works with this so far. The only magic on there is that pretty graph. Um, I didn't write the code for that. That's Cytoscape JS, really underrated library. If you ever want to have a beautiful graph on some kind of thing you're building. It's great, it's way quicker than D3, um, really nice tool. And I hacked up some stuff on there to try and make it show everything a little bit prettier. Yeah, and also similarly, um, storing with that graph data. You can use a graph database, they're great for some stuff. You can use a NoSQL database like MongoDB, that's great for things like sandbox output where you've got all these kind of random different types of indicators. In my case, I just used uh, MySQL and just whacked it all in there. It's fast with an index, um, a couple of hacks on there, so all domains in there are also stored in reverse, just so I can do a, a, a really fast lookup on subdomains without having a proper index and everything. And then the secret to building a, a graph kind of interface on top of SQL is add a couple of pivot functions. So just tell me everything that's linked to this one indicator, touch that table. So no magic, and you can create something yourself at home just like that.
Similarly, a few people have asked about what the data sources are. Um, there are quite a few. These are the main ones, though. So lots of love for these people for actually letting me use their data. Um, VirusTotal have a great public API, so you can use that for free. Uh, AlienVault OTX, really cool guys, great community tool. Um, again, they have an API there. Malware and payload security, really good sandboxes, worth checking out. Uh, I checked the terms and conditions to make sure it was allowed to use for non-commercial use, and then subsequently spoke to these people, but I didn't always ask in advance, and that's kind of maybe a lesson too in terms of free community projects. To an extent, if it's something you're building yourself, people are generally pretty friendly, and no one's complained yet, so that was very nice of them. And subsequently, a lot of them have talked, spoken about um, integrating some of that back into them too, so everybody wins. Why might you want to build something like this? Uh, well, I get to come to Belfast. It's got my name out there, so if you're building a free tool, you can get something back. The uh, taxi driver on the way here told me that that wheel is actually no longer here. Apparently, that's been moved to Leeds, so I would have changed that picture if I'd known that in advance. Um, but still, it's a nice picture, though. Uh, and also get to use it. So for me, I built this because I wanted to use it. I wasn't even sure I was going to release it publicly at first. It was just something that I thought might be quite useful. Another reason is, yeah, back in the end of 2014, when I was building this, uh, I was a bit ill over Christmas, so I just sat there program for a little while. There weren't quite so many tools. That wasn't that kind of threat intel buzz explosion that's been the last couple of years. So things like um, crits, I don't think was publicly available. It was if you, if you knew them, and then they put them to GitHub a bit later. Um, tools like Passive Total, I think, were around. Uh, Threat Connect's great, it's been around for a while. MISP is awesome. If you want to have a bunch of data and then share it with other people, if you've got some kind of a uh, seam solution or anything, you want to get all your data in, not only do MISP um, have a great free solution for that, they also have some free feeds too. So they've got pretty high fidelity trusted data you can get without having to pay for it, which is nice. 2016, I wouldn't build Threat Crowd today. There are so many tools like this now. So a threat miner built by the guy I used to sit next to him until about a month ago. Um, they work in slightly different ways, but brilliant tool. Uh, again, OTX, IBM at first. If you've used uh, their threat exchange, it's free. You can use it at first. It wasn't very good. Now it's got a load of data in. It's a lot better now. Never used Facebook uh, threat exchange, but is anyone here using Facebook's threat thing? Uh, it's like a long application process. I hear it's good, but how many personal experience with it? Yeah, tons, tons of them now. I guess that's the point. A quick couple of tricks in case it's useful on some of those tools. So Threat Miner, um, as well as doing all the normal kind of search for indicator stuff you get and everything else, if there's a sector you're particularly interested in or maybe a business that you're interested in, you can do a free text search over a bunch of reports and it indexes them all and presents it to you nicely. So uh, on a kind of business side of thing, if you're going to meet a, a customer or something and you need to quickly know who's targeting that sector, Walk it into that site and you can uh, find a bunch of reports in it. In this case, it's one thing that works better than Google for that. Oh, yeah, and also, uh, it's kind of diving into the weeds a bit, but if you've used Florian Roth's Loki, it's a great free scanning tool that you can combine Yara signatures, other kind of custom antivirus stuff to search through disks. There's also really nice integrations there where it will download a ton of um, intel from a lot of these free sites and uh, stick it in a nice format for you. So you can have hack on top of Florian's code and get a bunch of bad things in a nice CSV file. So that's the eSheep. I'm not sure how many people remember that from Windows 95, but they were great. Uh, in terms of stats, um, I'm surprised by how popular Threat Crowd has become. So it's nice chatting to people in the small industry that happen to have used Threat Crowd as well. I think most people um, that come to the site, you can see it's 60,000 users last month. There's people that Google a domain or an antivirus definition. They're not full-time cybersecurity people. And then wonder what the hell is that graph and all that kind of tumbleweed. Um, but there are a few hundred people that use it every day repeatedly. Um, it has got a good kind of user base there. Another thing to keep in mind too is any kind of online platform like this, whether it be virus total, an online sandboxing site, even some of the something like Google as well, is what happens to that data when someone like me then has it sent to my server. So in my case, I'm not going to hunt through individual users. I mean, I've got the logs, I use analytics, and um, I'm not going to hunt up one person, but I will use it to get trends. And that can provide a bit like ghetto AV vendor. I can get like a really kind of a small version of what a vendor might see. So there's some way better data in that last Talus talk. Um, you know, visibility over hundreds of thousands, millions of users. But here you can see here's some rough correlation around some malware like Drydex. Um, you see the long kind of tapering up and then the peak. This is just a subset of the people hitting this. This is people that came straight from Google, very particular detection they were looking for. It's not a security researcher. 
This is someone whose AV has flagged up in this. Locky similarly, you can see there's a big pickup. Um, yeah, I guess around January, February. Yeah, February. See, maybe the drop down Dried X2. Going to tell us talk a lot. That was new to me. Interesting when they're talking about some of the, the takedowns there. But given it uses the, uh, some of the same distribution uh, botnets as Dried X, I hear there's a bit of an overlap, and maybe that's why Dried X has been dropped in favor of Locky for a while. Also, insight into some uh, rarer malware. So, Suffolk is an interesting uh, piece of malware. I've been around for a while, a few detections around it. Uh, probably notable now because there have been the DNC leaks and you know, all those kind of hacks have been in the news recently. One of the groups indicated there, this is one of their main pieces of malware. So this gives you kind of a very rough idea of some potential targeting there. So, see, so yeah, Germany is flashing out quite strongly there, Ukraine, Romania. So, given who is perhaps behind some of those attacks, it's not a that's surprising where uh, people are being affected with. So an AV vendor would have this kind of data times a thousand, but this can still give some kind of rough trending ideas. Issues, it's always fun running a public website and there are tons of problems. So um, I was saying before I did write a bit of the code after a couple of beers, that's the kind of reason why I decided against having a username and passwords on the site. I don't trust my own code, particularly in my spare time to actually protect that kind of data. Um, thankfully, no issues I'm aware of yet, so that's good. Um, one interesting thing I've seen too is I was investigating a, uh, a campaign and I noticed that a lot of the, it was quite a small campaign, it was on the radar, nothing was reported on it, but just normal commodity kind of target attack stuff. And someone went through flagging all the domains in that campaign as not malicious. And they were coming from a network that was just geographically located the same area. Maybe a coincidence, maybe someone just didn't know what they were doing, but um, that was interesting. I think you saw uh, Claudio's talk recently on uh, Iranian attacks. He had a far better example of that, where there was someone going on to the forum, the support forum of an AV vendor, and they're asking them to whitelist their malware. And, uh, that was a great example. Every week, I'll get about two or three people emailing me, um, asking why their website's on my website. Um, it can be pretty frustrating. <laughs> they don't understand, you know, what does this mean? Is my site bad? What are you telling people? But it's quite understandable too. Um, lots of mum and pop shops, they get infected with things like Telsacrypt and then get used as the, the first stage compromised downloader. So we've had that a few times, also being used as command and control servers. And then there's one person I was talking to where their small business had been ruined um, and then they're having to change website. It's just the worst thing. Because all the AV, AV vendors have blocked their site after it got compromised. So for them, they've just seen their, their money shut down. So. Lots of those kind of contacts. Also DDoS too. So you know you made it when you start getting DDoS, so there are some uh, denial of service attacks against Threat Crowd in uh, January beginning of that year, this year. So that's nice. It means that someone cared, so it's a compliment. Cloudflare is awesome though, so I'm um, thankfully cleaned up most of that, which is good. Uh, there's a real tenuous link to Taylor Swift, so I'm sorry about that. It's not, not a real thing. So yeah, like I said, a lot's changed since 2014. Um, blank space came out in 2014. That's why that's there. And uh, going on from like, would I build this today? A lot's changed, not just in terms of how many platforms there are out there in terms of threat intel based on that big growth in that industry. A lot of the attacks that people are seeing are obviously changing too. And there's been a lot of discussion around to what extent are target attacks decreasing, how much they've been overblown in all the reporting, which um, we saw Brian Campbell's great talk earlier. I think he touched on as well. I think most people would say they've got the APT fatigue. And the tool like Threat Intel really was originally designed to track those kind of targeted domains together. It's been used a lot now, though, to target uh, follow crimeware, but it does change the use case for a tool like that. So a couple of examples of that. So 2013 was all that big buzz around targeted attacks. Hangover was quite a famous example. So Norman Shark wrote a report on a pretty uh, low standard attack group. Um, they did some crazy things, like they left their own apparently company name in their malware, which was a bit mistake. Did it a few times. They also did things like they registered um, domains for command and control to their own names and their company name. Did that a few times, and then, then add who is privacy a week later. Um, obviously, doesn't stop people from getting that data still. The best thing, though, this wasn't really reported. It was a very small report that didn't get picked up from an Indian company that was looking at it. But they also used essentially their own file server as a command and control server, left it open as well. And then they had their company's intellectual property just sitting there on their command and control server. And they were targeting all kinds of people. They were targeting telcos in the West. Really wide targeting, big campaign. And uh, yeah, so a lot to pivot on. 
and the Torvalds threat crowd or anything like that could just light up the whole campaign straight away. Less so today. So there's been a lot of reporting on a campaign called Patchwork. Still pretty crappy. I think every vendor was tracking these guys for a good year or so. Um, and there's some links there between the malware and a little bit in the infrastructure to those original hangover campaigns. And I think most people say probably same group. But gone are the, uh, the PDB strings in the malware with their own company's name. Gone are the file servers being used command and control. And the problem here is that these reports, while they're great and they do inform people, um, they are making it harder for tools like ThreatCrowd to actually get you those results. Similarly, this was a great talk. Um, I, think, I think it was Mark Parsons did this. Done this a couple of times recently at Bellside last week. And this is on chaining through SSL certificates. So, same before, SSL certificates, great pivot point. Attackers reuse them. He's got some really nice examples in there. So, one of them was, uh, again, the recent DNC attacks. That links to an SSL certificate through to attacks in the Bundestag um, a couple of years ago. Linked to a well-known group, um, Softkey, APT28. So, well-known group. But they've been using that for a long time. And a lot of people have been tracking that SSL certificate. And they've tracked many, many different attacks with that through tools like ThreatCrowd or Passive Total or ThreatMiner. They're probably not going to use that anymore. So again, tools like ThreatCrowd have a slight, for this type of uh, research, diminishing value, I think. The final one, just to bring the, uh, the e-sheet back in there again. There's been a lot of discussion about the extent those kind of attacks have been dropping off. So this is FireEye's graph of uh, mandant responses to they say are Chinese um, groups where they've responded to them. So a pretty clear graph here. And I know a lot of people would question the data. Personally, I think they have pretty good data here as much as anyone in the private sector is going to have. You can see a clear drop off. I mean, also, given that they are investigating these things and they will have maybe first started those attacks maybe a year beforehand, depending on how they were told about the attack and how they identified it, you kind of shift that graph back a year. So again, for a lot of those groups that are really easy to track and we've all been tracking for a long time, there are less of them to track. However, if you look at the marketing reports, again, touching on what Brian Campbell was uh, talking about in the last talk, the talk before last, um, this is the stats for APT Notes, so a collection of target attack reports. There's no clear correlation here. I'm not sure what those summer peaks are. Um, I thought maybe that was security conferences and people releasing them then, but no clear correlation there between what's probably going on in those real attacks. But obviously, you can't trust all that marketing says. So going a bit off topic here, but I thought I'd give a couple of examples just to, uh, to throw something controversial out in the room. Uh, so Norse, um, and saw that map before. They published a couple of reports on one was on Iranian attacks against uh, infrastructure. And there may well be some good evidence of that happening. They didn't have any evidence. They just made it up, sent it around to congressmen around the time they're voting on legislation. A bit irresponsible. There's a Route 9B report um, on zero day hashes about how the, the same guys linked to the DNC attacks were attacking uh, banks. They just found a name server that was being used by a lot of people, including uh, Nigerian scammers. And they linked it by that name server and then said it was all the same stuff. And obviously not very accurate. Another one wrote up a 12-year-old uh, campaign targeting government that was just adware. And as soon as you looked at it, it was obvious adware. It had a EULA. The malware made you agree to a license agreement before it installed. That, that wasn't a massive campaign. So yeah, the correlation there. And the IBM one's a bit unfair, actually. That's not that bad. It's just perhaps poor phrasing. But on the corollary, for one thing, I mean, just because attacks against the UK and US from some places might be decreasing, um, and talking to friends at other IR firms and things, I think that might be a trend. Other countries are not experiencing that, so apparently uptick in some attacks against Russia. If you've been following some attacks in Japan last year, massive problems there. A whole spate of gigantic incidents all linked to a few groups. Big up to there, India too. And obviously, you can't focus on one country. Russia's been in the news a lot recently. Not going to go into whether or not I agree with that attribution, but there's a lot of other people out there. Swift, this is the kind of thing which really is uh, getting the news a lot more. People have been attacking Swift for quite a long time. There are a few different groups doing it, but it's really picked up because of the Bangladesh case. And these kind of cases, that's perhaps kind of the bread and butter for a lot of the kind of uh, case studies people are using. A bit less there, though, in terms of pivoting. The kind of campaigns I've seen from that, there are some links there. You can go through the malware. There's some reuse of infrastructure. There's a lot less in those kind of classic cases we're used to tracking. And finally, obviously, if you look at what people are caring about and talking about, like the last talk, things like ransomware. I mean, you can talk what you want about the sexy targeted attacks, but things like ransomware are what people are really worrying about right now. 
So I was in Black Hat last month, and I saw a talk by CrowdStrike, and they had the normal kind of, um, you have a adversary problem, not a malware problem. And they got great guys, and you know, they got some great good statements there. But at the end of that, they tacked on, and we also do ransomware, because that's what people are worrying about right now. And using a tool like ThreatCrowd and the other kind of things that have been built up in the last two years of investment to track ransomware just isn't as effective. Just the way that people don't reuse the infrastructure so much, the way people don't register domains. For the... Who is it? No, I don't mind. <laughs> right. Have you ever seen the thing where someone's on the theater and then they got um, some famous actor and he, got, he answered the phone and then spoke to them for a while? I'm not so famous, so that wouldn't be worth doing, unfortunately. And yeah, obviously, so yeah. The summary of those last four slides, apart from filler to make this a 30, 45 minute talk, was that crime is a big problem. Tracking that's a bit trickier. Guys like Talas have got great visibility there. Tools like mine are useful, but not quite so good. Tools like this, though, are great. So Alien Vault, OTX, fantastic community um, project that's given away, where people can add those indicators in there. They rely on uh, crowdsourcing, doing it properly, not a crappy blacklist like what I have. And they can share those indicators. You can say if you trust people. So if someone adds Google.com to, to that list, you can just say, no, you idiot. I'm not going to trust you anymore. Great tool. And then these kind of things here as well, like this Locky tracker, the Drydex tracker, Fiodo tracker, they've been around for years and years and years. And they're really, really good tools. So that's perhaps where a lot of the kind of threat intel is going, in a way back to where it was, maybe. If anyone disagrees with me as well, I'm going to shout out. It's a lot more interesting discussion. In terms of where threat crowd's going, well, um, I don't know. I've got a lot of ideas, so that's my Trello where I list them. That's not all the things. I'm not sure how much time I'm going to keep spending building on it. It depends on you know, what people want. So if anyone's got any ideas, really keen to hear about it. I've had a lot of office support, so lots of people offering to help me with the hosting, particularly when I've got downtime and I run out of a hard disk space. Also, other kind of companies too, help, helping to uh, offering to pick up the slack, maybe help with coding. And finally, I'm thinking about maybe turning over the open source community if people are willing to put that time in, um, and if there is a value to people. I'm not sure how much that's the case. So yeah, any ideas, hit me up. Finally, in terms of what I might be doing next, I've been building a uh, Linux distro for Threat Intel for a while, and I'm trying to solve a couple of problems there. So one thing is that there's the InfoSec echo chamber. Everyone's building the same damn tools to save the same, same problems, so you can't solve the same problem 20 different ways. So there's so many similar open source projects, and that's great that people are building them, but it takes so long to evaluate them all. So the kind of things I'm sticking there are put them all in there, just let you run up a quick Docker instance or build into the installation, try out and see. Also try to link into the open source Intel too. So before I was talking about some of those great free feeds, they're all linked up in there, integrated with um, tools to apply it to. So tools you can apply that against network data, tools you can apply it against host data. So yeah, it's going to be free, obviously, just a Linux distro. It's a bit different to things like Remnux for malware or SIF for forensics. If anyone's got any ideas or contributions, awesome to hear from you. Finally, I was going to show a demo if I've got time, but I don't know how we're running. I tend to talk a bit quick. Yeah, cool. I should have put some more memes in to take some more time. Oh, yeah, I need the sheep. Actually, I haven't connected to the Wi-Fi yet. Is this going to work? Is the Wi-Fi here trustworthy and free? I'll see. Oh, well, what's going to happen to my laptop now on the CDF network? No, I was only going to stick in the, uh, the demo at the end anyway. But if you want to try out Threat Crowd, just uh, go to threatcrowd.org. It sounds like a few people have used it anyway, so do check it out. And if you want to find out about car hacking, I think you probably have enough time to do that. But uh, if anyone has any questions, do ask. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I released it in the worst way, in a sense, um, just to make sure I didn't lose um, the script. And it's basically a big shell script that installs on an Ubuntu box. I whacked it on Pastebin, just in case I lost my hard drive sometime and didn't announce it to anyone. So yeah, it will be. I, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if, you, if you've seen SIFT or something like that, it has the same kind of install it runs through. So yeah, I'll, I'll clean it up a little bit first, and then I'll um, stick it on Twitter, something like that. If anyone's got any views, then yeah, I'd love to hear some feedback on it. Yeah, it'd be great. Do it. Any other questions? Great. Well, if you'd like to do your own Threat Crowd demo and you have a working internet connection, then uh, do try out. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.